<laughs> okay, good afternoon, everyone. On this Hi, Rabbi. How's everyone doing? Good afternoon. Hope you're having a good Tuesday. PH. Uh, we're ready to begin our Tuesday. class now. And uh, since Thursday night, we begin the two day holiday of Shavuot, which will be on Friday and Shabbat of this week. Therefore, we're going to discuss the holiday of Shavuot. As I always say, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll try to address them as we go along. So, as you know, Shavuot is one of the three major festivals. The first one was Pesach, which we just celebrated. The second one is Shavuos. And the third one, of course, is Sukkot. Shavuot commemorates the day that we received the Torah at Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, and the subsequent Torah. And this year, my friends, will be the 3,332nd anniversary. This is a marriage. This is a marriage that has stood the test of time. God. Uh, took us as his nation, we took God at, as, as our God, and we have remained loyal and faithful to one another. I find this to be very inspiring and miraculous, that after everything we've endured as a nation, 3,000, over 3,332 years ago, all the exiles and the persecution, yet we have main, remained steadfast in our loyalty and our commitment to the Torah and to Hashem. And it's reminiscent of what Moshe Rabbeinu said to God after the sin of the golden calf, when God was very disappointed in the Jewish people. And God says they are stiff-necked pe people after all the miracles I performed for them, taking them out of Egypt, splitting the sea. They went after getting the Ten Commandments. And just uh, 40 days later, worshipped an, an idol, a golden calf. <clears throat> And Moshe Rabbeinu, in his defense of the Jewish people, says, yes, they are a stiff-necked nation. But that stiff-neckedness is precisely what will pre preserve them. Because they will not bow. When you have a stiff neck, you don't bow, right? They will not bow or cower to any other force, any other power, any other nation, any other religion. They will remain loyal and devoted and committed to Hashem. <clears throat> and indeed, Moshe Rabbeinu's words hold true till today. When we see that the Jewish people continues to thrive and not only survive, but thrive as a nation, despite everything we've endured. So Shavuos is a beautiful and remarkable holiday. And there is so much associated with the holiday of Shavuot. Although ironically, Shavuos is the only holiday that doesn't have a special mitzvah. Uh, every holiday has a mitzvah. Rosh Hashanah, you blow the shofar, Yom Kippur, you have to fast. Sukkot, you have to build a sukkah. Shake the lul of an esrik, Pesach, you have to eat the matzah, Chanukah, you have to light the menorah, uh, Purim, you have to read the Megillah. Shavuos does not have any positive commandments. It's just a holiday. They have to refrain from any labor and celebrate. And in Israel, it's one day. In the diaspora, for us, it's two days. <clears throat> and one of the reasons why there is no mitzvah is because it's the day of receiving the Torah. In other words, what we try to do is be a vessel today to be receptive to hearing God's message to us. Sometimes we have to just stand still, stop doing things. You know, we always talk about someone said, uh, you know, don't, don't just uh, do something, just stand still. Uh, sometimes we're so busy doing that we don't just accept and receive. This is the holiday of the giving of the Torah. <clears throat> but while God gives us the Torah, we have to receive the Torah. Now, I want to share with you a beautiful passage in the Talmud. The Talmud says that there's a connection between marriage and the study of Torah. The Talmud says that whoever gladdens uh, and rejoices with a bride and a groom merits to study Torah, to receive the Torah. Now, there is an obvious correlation between marriage and the giving of the Torah because Shavuos was the holiday that God took us to be his wedded wife. 
and pledged his loyalty and fidelity to us as we did to him. We took vows that we would be a loyal nation. And he gave us the Torah, which is like the Ketubah, the marriage contract. But what does the Talmud mean? The Talmud says that if you may rejoice with a bride and a groom, you'll merit to receive the Torah. Furthermore, furthermore, the Talmud goes further and says, <clears throat> what's the connection? It says the Talmud that by the giving of the Torah, it says five times the word kolot, sounds, voices. It says, ayak uh, kolot, the brakim, do is thunder and lightning, which is two sounds. And then it says, kol hashofar, do is the sound of the blast of the shofar. Uh, and then it goes on to say that Moshe Yedaber, Moshe would speak, and God would answer him with a voice. And if you count in the verse, it says the word kol, which means sound, voice, five times. On the other hand, the Talmud says, when it comes to the celebration of a bride and a groom, it also says in the verse five times the word kol. It says, Kol sasom v'kol simcha, kol chatam v'kol kala, kol metzalot chatanim mechupatam u'narim mimishtei neginatam. There was the, the sound, the voice of the bride, the voice of the groom, uh, the, the groom, the bride, uh, the sound of rejoicing, the sound of gladness, and the sound of uh, newlyweds uh, coming out of the bridal canopy. So since it says the word kol five times by the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, and it says it five times by a wedding celebration, therefore the Talmud compares the two and says, you see, if you rejoice with the bride and the groom, you merit to receive the Torah, which was given with five sounds, just like the celebration of the bride and the groom. Now, this is very nice. The verse parallels each other. <laughs> but what's the deeper message and meaning? And perhaps it's quite interesting that uh, in recent years, there was uh, a new book published, which discusses the five languages of love. And it talks about how in a marriage, we have five languages of love, that different people uh, express love or understand love in one of the five different uh, languages. What are the five languages of love? So the first language of love is words of affection. You know, that uh, people who they find love mostly through words of affection to one another. Then there's the second language of love, which is gifts. They find love through presence uh, given to one another. Then there is the third language of love, which is through service. Uh, when, when you do things for one another, uh, you know, provide for one another, this is the third language of love. The fourth language of love is quality time. Some people understand love without spending quality time. And the fifth language of love is affection. So different marriages, different people understand love in different ways. And for one person, their primary way of love is words. Other one, it's physical gifts. Another one, it may be service, doing things for me, like vacuuming or doing the dishes or whatever it may be. For a fourth person, maybe let's just spend quality time together. That's my language of love. And then for a fifth person, language of love is physical touch and affection. So now we look at our relationship with God as Jews and the giving of the Torah. And what is a language? A language is a voice. That's what the verse is saying. There are five voices, five languages of love in a marriage. And there's five languages of love in our relationship with God. And we'll see that all these five languages, of course, even if your primary language is one or the other, you still need all the five languages in your marriage. Same thing in our relationship with God. We need all five languages of love. What are the five languages of love in our relationship with God? So the first one we said is words of affection. Well, you all know what that is. Prayer. We pray morning, afternoon, and evening. These are our loving words of affection, of gratitude, of appreciation, of thanksgiving. I always say to brides and grooms, I said, you need the three A's to have a successful marriage. Attention, appreciation, and affection. Words of appreciation words of attention. This is what we do every day. We turn our attention to God in our prayers and we express words of affection because that is the first language of love. Second language of love is gifts. What's gifts? Gifts obviously is charity. When we make a sacrifice, when we give of ourselves, in the olden days you bought an offering in the temple, today you give charity. When you give of your hard-earned resources to help others, 
and fulfill God's commandment to give tzedakah, that's showing the act of giving something towards God, and that's the second language of love. What's the third language of love? Third language of love is quality time. I want to spend quality time with my spouse. What do we have? Every week we have Shabbat, where we say we're not going to work we're not going to run errands. We're not going to be distracted. We're just going to spend quality time with God, studying, learning, praying, meditating, observing Judaism or Jewish holidays. These are designated times to spend quality time with Hashem. It's marked off in our calendar. As a matter of fact, the word for holiday is moed, a designated meeting time. So we have the third language of love, which is quality time with Hashem. What's the fourth language of love? Service. Right? Some wife says, yeah, I don't want your presence. Just uh, clean the house, uh, make your bed. That's, that shows me you love me. Well, same thing with Hashem. We have a little commandments, things we do, things we refrain from doing, because sometimes service is not just what you do, but what you don't do to honor your spouse. And therefore, the Torah says you have to have service of Hashem. And that's the mitzvot, the commandments. And finally, we have the fifth category. What's the fifth category? Physical touch and affection. Now, obviously, you can't touch God physically, and so you can't have the physical affection. But what do we do? What's unique about Judaism is that all of the commandments are associated with physical actions. So when we put on tefillin in the morning, we have to take a physical hide of an animal and write parchment and make tefillin out of leather and put them on. Why do we need the physical? Why can't we just meditate about God and pray to God with our lips and our hearts and our mind? Why do we have to interact with the physical objects? And if you think about all of Judaism, it's always associated with tangible physical deeds. On Sukkot, we have to shake the lul of an esrig. On Pesach, we have to eat the matzah. Why do we have so many physical, tangible mitzvot? And the answer is because there has to be the element of touch. When we do the actual mitzvah, we touch the divine. And we unite with God as one. I'll give you a parable of the Baal Shem Tov Shears. He says that there was one someone who came to see the king. So he's never been to the palace, and he enters into the palace, and he's awestruck by the magnificence and the beauty and the artwork in the corridors. And he's so enamored by the exquisite beauty and splendor and maj majesty of the palace that he's so enthralled and so awestruck and so in love with the beauty that he gets so distracted that he never makes it to the inner chamber of the palace to greet the king and to be one with the king. So too, other religions, they focus sometimes on all the abstract, you know, spiritual, metaphysical, uh, philosophical, meditation, internal feelings, which are all very important, but they fail to have the tangible tangible, concrete, physical deeds that ultimately drive home the relationship. So in Judaism, of course, we have thought and prayer and meditation and study. All of that is vital. But the most important thing is to do the mitzvah. If I meditate for three hours in the morning about the deepest significance of tefillin, but I don't actually take the skin of the animal and buy, make a pair of tefillin and tie it on my hand, I haven't done the mitzvah. Same thing with every mitzvah. I could meditate about the, the, the holiness of Shabbat, but if I didn't make the kiddush, I didn't do the mitzvah of sanctifying the day of Shabbat. It always has to be the tangible manifestation. That is saying, beyond the awe and the love, I have to actually embrace God, and that's the physical mitzvah. Very much like, again, a relationship. Imagine you don't buy your wife a birthday present, or you don't buy your husband a birthday present, or you don't bring them your wife flowers, or you. And, and your wife says, you know, you didn't bring me flowers on my birthday. Well, what happened? Well, you know, it was our anniversary. Why didn't you bring me anything to express your love? And you say, what do you mean? You, you need a few flowers, a piece of jewelry. I love you so much in my heart. And your spouse will say, yeah, it's great that you love me, but there has to be a physical manifestation. You have to express it in a tangible way. That's the fifth dimension, the dimension of mitzvot, of actually performing the mitzvot. And that's what this holiday is all about. And to take it one step further while we're on the subject of the importance of physical manifestation, but encompassing all the five languages of love. Again, appreciation, verbal uh, expressions of love, prayer. Then we have gifts, which is the performance of 
tzedakah, giving charity, giving of ourselves. Then we have quality time, which is Shabbat and holidays. Then we have the element of uh, affection, um, which is the, the performance of the mitzvot in a tangible way. Um, and then we, the fifth element, we said there is words of affection, there is gifts, there's quality time. Oh, and then the service, doing things for each other. That's all, the doing the, what Hashem asks us to do and refraining from what we're not supposed to do. But I just want you to understand something else that the rabbis say. The rabbis, when they talk about the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, they ask the question, what really happened at Mount Sinai? We know we have a tradition that the patriarchs and the matriarchs, even before the Torah was given, already studied Torah. So if they already had an advanced copy of the Torah and studied Torah before it was given, what's so great about Mount Sinai? And the rabbis say, look what happened at Mount Sinai. God came down to the mountain and told Moses to come up on the mountain. So heaven and earth are meeting. Earth is being elevated and heaven is coming down. And I rabbis say, that's the message of Mount Sinai. That after Mount Sinai, man was able to elevate themselves to a higher spiritual plane. But that they were able to do before Mount Sinai. What was unique about Mount Sinai that never happened before was that God descended to the mountain, which means holiness can be brought down upon earth. And this is a very powerful Jewish concept. The idea that we could take a physical object and imbue it with spiritual qualities of holiness. So for example, when you uh, have a Torah scroll, but not even a Torah scroll, any Jewish book, and uh, the book is worn out and it's old, what do you do with it? You have to bury it. Why do you have to bury it? Why can't you just throw it out in the garbage? Of course, you would never throw an old Torah in the garbage, God forbid. You wouldn't even throw a Siddur in the garbage or a Chumash. And you may say, why? If, well, it's just a book. I'm not using it anymore. And the answer is that we believe that since this book was used for Torah study or for prayer, the physical pages of this book is not like Harry Potter, that if you're not using it anyway to throw it in the garbage. This book is physically holy. The same thing with your tefillin. If you have tefillin that's not fit for use, you can't just throw them out. They're holy. Same thing with the body. That's why we don't have cremation. We have burial. So the body in, embodied and in, was enclosed within it was the soul. And therefore the soul permeates the body. And the body, the physical flesh becomes holy. And same thing with ritual objects become holy. And the, the Medrash actually gives a parable. The Medrash says, that there was once two countries and they had a border and they had a, a law that you couldn't go from one country to the next. And one day the, the, the countries made peace, so to speak, and now they had the commerce between them and you can now go import and export from one country to the next. So to God, the rabbis say, there's a verse in the book of Psalms that says, the heavens are shamayim, shamayim, Hashem, the heavens belong to God and the earth belongs to mankind. So rabbis say, there was a border between heaven and earth. Man could not ascend to the heights of heaven and heaven could not descend on earth. So what happened at Mount Sinai? The border was open. Now you could traverse from one to the other. You could draw heaven down to earth and earth can go up to heaven. So much so that there's a beautiful story in the Talmud in Tractate Shabbat. The Talmud says when Moses went up to the heaven to receive the Torah after the Ten Commandments, Moses went up for 40 days and 40 nights to heaven. Then he came down with the Ten Commandments. He saw the Jews made a golden calf. He smashed the tablets and then a second tablets were given. It's a beautiful story in the Talmud. The Talmud says when Moses went up to heaven, the angels looked and said, what? A human being is walking around in heaven? We never saw humans here. And they said to God, what is this human being doing here in heaven? And the Talmud says in Tractate Shabbat that the God responded and said he came to get the Torah. And the angel said, what? This precious prized possession that you have in your treasure house, the Torah that's been in existence from before the creation, because our rabbis say that God used the Torah as the blueprint, like an architect uses a blueprint to create a building. God created the world based on the blueprints of the Torah. So God, they said, you're going to give this to mankind? How could you give away this Torah to human beings of flesh and blood? As they said to God, uh, Moses is a Yelud Isha. He's, he was born from a mother. He's not an angel. That Torah is so holy and pristine. It should stay in the, in the heavens with the angels. It's a heavenly document, not an earthly document. So Moses, God says to Moses, the Talmud says, well, answer them. 
And the Talmud says, Moses says, I'm scared to debate angels. Uh, they're too powerful. They'll consume me with the breath of their mouth. So God says to Moses, hold on to my throne and you can respond to them. And here is Moses' debate in heaven with the angels. And what does he say to the angels? Brilliant. Moses says to the angels, imagine debating angels. What would you do? You would be so scared to even debate them, right? And Moses was scared. And God had to tell him, hold on to my chair, my holy throne. Then you could debate them. What does Moses say? Says the Talmud in Shabbat. Moses says to the angels, this Torah, let's open it up and read it and see what it says. And he starts with the first commandment. I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And then Moses turned to the angels. And he says, have you been slaves in Egypt? Were you subservient to Pharaoh? That God took you out of Egypt? Clearly not. So obviously the Torah is not addressing you. Let's continue, he said. What else does it say? Honor your father and mother. Tell me, angels, do you have a father and mother in heaven that you need to honor? What else does it say? It says, don't steal. Do you have jealousy amongst yourselves that you're tempted to steal from one another? And he went on and on with all the commandments. And he said, clearly this Torah is not for you. It's for us human beings. And miyad hodulo, the Talmud says, the angels agreed that you're right. This is for you. And he gave them the Torah. And there's a lot of depth to the story. But one obvious lesson from the story is that the Torah was given to us precisely because we're human beings. Sometimes we feel, you know, I'm not worthy of the Torah. I'm not capable of keeping the Torah because I have this failing or this shortcoming. No, don't be envious. Uh, by nature, I'm envious, you know. Don't speak ill of another person. I, I often do that. But that's precisely why God gave us the Torah because he knows our human condition, that we're vulnerable and susceptible to do these things. And therefore, he has to warn us not to cheat, not to lie, not to steal, not to kill, not to be envious, not to commit adultery, to honor our father and mother, to on and on. Because God wrote it for us, for our sake, because he understands our human condition. So Moses brings the Torah down to earth, and that's man's mission and the Jews' mission, to bring holiness down to earth, to make heaven on earth. And that's why Judaism, unlike other religions, which sometimes encourages people to become a recluse and to isolate themselves and to distance themselves from worldly desires and temptations and pleasures and just live in isolation. Judaism says the contrary. The goal of Judaism is not to run away onto a mountaintop and meditate from morning to night or to be a monk in a monastery because that doesn't change the world around you. The whole goal of Judaism is to be a, be a part of the world and to infuse the world with Hashem's will, with godliness to reveal god's presence in the physical world and that's why in the midst of business in the midst of eating in the midst of drinking in the midst of doing all the mundane physical things that everyone else does we try to draw down holiness and godliness and consciousness and awareness of hashem's presence by implementing his will here on earth we're his ambassadors just like an ambassador goes to another country to carry out the country's and uh mission and, and agenda and represent the country in a foreign land, we were sent from heaven, our souls were sent from heaven down to earth as ambassadors to bring the heavenly regime, the heavenly uh, uh, kingdom, and bring those values down to earth and implement it in this world. And that's what each and every one of us are as Jews, a nation of kingdom of priests, priests of people who administer, who serve and bring awareness and cognizance to the world that God is the ruler, not only in the heavens above, but on the earth below. Now, one of the customs of Shavuos that everyone's pretty familiar with <clears throat> is dairy, right? We all know, again, there's no laws on Shavuos. You don't have to do any special mitzvah, but there are a lot of customs. And one of the most famous customs, of course, is to eat dairy foods. So people have ice cream or cheesecake, and it's a very pleasurable aspect of the holiday. And the question is, why dairy? And there's a whole host of reasons and explanations given for why we have dairy. Some of the most uh, famous reasons why we have dairy is because the Torah, which we received on Shavuos, is compared to milk and honey beneath my tongue, says in the book of Proverbs. So it's like milk and honey. It's sweet. The Torah is sweet. 
And by the way, there's a custom when we take children to, to, to Jewish school for the first time after they get their hair shearing at three years old, we take them in to learn the olive base. And if you've ever been to an Upsharanish, or we do it at the Upsharanish, we pour honey on the letters of the olive base. And when the kid identifies the letter, he gets to lick off some of the honey. And that's an example of how we teach children from a very early age to associate the words of the Torah, Hebrew letters, with honey and sweetness. Which, by the way, teaches a lot about psychology that the rabbis understood that there's physical uh, messages that are communicated that the body, by eating the honey off the letter, internalizes the message subconsciously forever that words of Torah are sweet. But the idea that Torah is compared to milk and honey, that's one reason. Another reason given is that when the Jews got the laws of kosher, they realized they didn't have two sets of pots and pans. They were cooking milk and meat in the same dishes. And now they have to go kosher their dishes or get new dishes until they make new dishes. They have to just eat dairy that don't need dishes or to cook. So they eat dairy. And many other reasons for dairy. But another reason that I'd like to share with you is that it's explained in Kabbalah that the difference between, you know, the, there's the color white and the color red. And Kabbalah explains that white represents kindness, red represents judgment. Now, we all understand when somebody's angry, their blood boils, their face turns red, you know. So blood represents judgment or severity. You know, when you're angry, your, your, your blood vessels are popping, you know. White represents purity and kindness. That's why on the high holidays we wear white, which represents kindness. We want divine mercy and favor from above. So white represents kindness and red represents judgment. Meat, we all know red meat, right? The blood in the meat. So therefore, that's why we drain the blood. We want to take out as much of the severity. But the point is, at the end of the day, meat represents judgment, <clears throat> redness. Why? Because you have to kill the animal. You have to do something which, is, um, which requires uh, strength and requires gavura, gavura is power to subdue the animal and slaughter it in order to take its meat. So meat and poultry or, you know, redness represents that judgment and severity and power and strength. <clears throat> On the other hand, milk represents kindness. Why? First of all, milk is liquid, it flows naturally. It's not hard and coarse like the meat. But also, we all understand that the animal lives while it willfully gives the milk and it's happy to release its milk. It relieves itself of the pain of holding on to it. Well, furthermore, mother nurses her child with milk. So milk and dairy represents kindness. Now, a Jew needs both. We need to know when to say no and to be strong. We need to know how to have kindness. King Solomon says, with the right hand you show kindness, with the left hand you show discipline. But listen to the words of King Solomon. The right hand is more powerful than the left hand usually, which means the more powerful attribute in your nature is to be kindness. But at times you need to know how to also have boundaries and discipline and limits and, and, and be strong, so to speak, and to be, uh, come from a position of gavura, which is severity and judgment. But that's not the primary mode. The primary mode is kindness. And therefore, on the holiday, which commemorates the giving of the Torah and the celebration of the Torah, we focus on dairy, which represents chesed, kindness. <clears throat> because our rabbis say, what is the overriding message of the Torah? The Torah has five books to it, with many subjects, many commands, 613. But what's the theme? If there's one arc, ar arching overarching theme of the Torah, what is it? And our rabbis say it's all about chesed. Chesed is loving kindness. Because there could be kindness that's not loving. It's just, you know, sometimes you do kindness because it's, you know, it's beneficial or because it's prudent or because it's, uh, you know, you have some other ulterior motive. Or you do kindness with a relative of yours. It's not coming purely from love. It's just automatic. Loving kindness is just kindness for the sake of kindness, even for a stranger. So the main message of the Torah, Rabbi say, is kindness. How do you know that? Because the two bookends of the Torah, Rabbi say, are stories of kindness. The Torah begins with Adam and Eve being naked and ashamed in the garden and God manufacturing clothing for them. And the Torah ends with the passing of Moses and God burying Moses, providing for his burial needs. 
and finding him a burial site on Mount Nebo. And therefore, Rabbi says, since the so the Tchiloso, the Sofa Chesed, it begins with kindness, ends with kindness. Therefore, you could discern that the overriding message of the Torah is all about Chesed, is all about kindness. So the Torah is about kindness, and therefore Shavuot is all about kindness. And that's one of the reasons we focus on dairy during this holiday of Shavuot. Now, I want to talk a little bit also about the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments the first thing I want to point out is that unlike our Torah scrolls that are written with ink on parchment, the Ten Commandments were given on stones. And they were, first of all, engraved upon the stones. Now, what is the message of the Torah being engraved upon the stone, the Ten Commandments? So the first message is, and lesson is, that the Torah shouldn't just be like a superficial law. It has to become part of your nature, part of your character. In other words, it's not like by nature I want to steal, or by nature I want to be a false witness, or by nature I don't want to honor my father and mother. But I do it because God commanded me to, sort of like I pay my taxes or I stop at a red light because I have no choice. No. Torah says God wrote the Torah, and God knows your true nature. And therefore, when you do the mitzvot, you should realize <coughs> that they, they are already not only do you have to make them ingrained upon you and, and engraved upon you, but they're already engraved upon you. That's your true nature. So, for example, when you go to your nutritionist and your nutritionist gives you a healthy diet and says you can't eat these foods, you must eat these foods. You can either look at it like, oh, my nutritionist is making my life miserable. Now I got to give up cake and whatever, you know, sugars and sweets and whatever he told me I can't eat. She told me I can't eat. <clears throat> and have to eat healthy salad and vegetables and so on and so forth. I could look at it like an imposition, a burden. I have to listen to my nutritionist. But once you start doing it, you know, you're going to realize that you feel better, you're healthier, you're more energetic, you think clearer. Why? Because your body was craving these foods. And when you were consuming all the unhealthy foods, you may have got instant momentary pleasure from these foods, but you felt lethargic and you felt tired and you felt weak and you didn't feel good about yourself. Once you started eating well and you're exercising, suddenly you feel like a million dollars. And you realize that's what I wanted all along. I was tempted because of all the delicious foods that I was enjoying, <clears throat> but it really wasn't satisfying me on a deep level. And that's really the way we have to understand the Torah. Just like my body is designed in a way that it functions optimally when I eat the right foods and I take care of myself and I exercise. And only by doing that can I maximize my physical potential of my strength and live the longest and healthiest and most productive life. Same thing is spiritually. We all have an ashama soul. And our souls were designed, created in a way that it craves these commandments. These commandments is what makes us feel good. And, you know, <clears throat> I always say, if, if someone handed you a pen, you've never seen a pen before, and you don't know what it is, how do you figure it out what it is? So you start fooling around with it, and all of a sudden you see it writes. Ah, it must be a pen. But if I have a finger and it doesn't write, obviously it wasn't des designed to write. Whatever its function is, that tells you what it was designed for. <clears throat> Just like your body feels most energized when it eats healthy, we all all know the feeling of doing a good deed. There's a joy we all experience. When you do a good deed, no one has to know about it. And you don't even do it because you want God to reward you. You just feel good about yourself because you know you did a good deed. When you are selfless and giving, or when you're kind, or you're patient, or you're tolerant, or respectful, or caring, any virtue, any quality, you feel good about it. So you're proud of yourself. You know, the person provoked me. I didn't get angry. I, I responded with respect. You walk away feeling so good. But when you lose it and you yell at the person, you scream at the person, then you walk away, you feel terrible about yourself. What did I just do? I yelled at my spouse. I yelled at my kids. I, I yelled at my colleague. You're ashamed of yourself. What is that? That's your body or even deeper, your soul telling you that's the, what I was designed to do. I was designed to do good and not designed to be bad. And therefore, when I do something that's wrong, I naturally feel bad.
When I do something that's good, I naturally feel good about myself. And you think it's the opposite. If I just gave tzedakah, I just gave away some of my hard-earned money. Now I have less money to spend on myself. Why would I feel good about that? Physically, I lost out. I have less money to spend on myself to go shopping or treat myself to a trip. But I feel good. Why? Because I may have made a very nice donation to a worthy cause and lost some of my hard-earned money. But I feel good because my body may feel I lost physical pleasure, but my soul says I just gained the mitzvah. I did something that's righteous and noble, something that I was really created to do, to give of myself. As the old adage, you make a living by what you get, you make a life by what you give. So the fact that our soul, you know, it's like your car. When your car starts shaking or the dashboard starts lighting up, that's your car telling you, I need service. Same thing, our conscience, someone's that a conscience is something that feels bad when everything else feels good. If you're feeling so good, why are you feeling so bad? Because your conscience is bothering you. Why is your conscience bothering you? Because that's your soul communicating with you, just like your body when you're not healthy. Sends you signals, the, God forbid you have symptoms of an illness, and that makes you go to the doctor and get help. If you didn't know, then just one day you would wake up and God forbid it would be over. The symptoms alert you, you need to go get help. And sadly, sometimes people live unhealthy lives until they have symptoms, and then they go to the doctor, and the doctor says, you know, your heart can't take this anymore, you gotta start. Uh, exercising or your lungs can't take it, you got to stop smoking or your body can't take it, you have to stop eating or whatever the guidance of the doctor is. And then they wake up and take care of themselves. Same thing the soul. The soul sends you signals and says, listen, I'm not happy. I'm not happy the way you're acting. And that's what a conscience is. So the commandments were engraved upon the stone. <clears throat> the message of them being engraved upon the stone is that it's embedded in our very DNA and our spiritual nature. This is who we are. And therefore, we shouldn't fear Judaism. We shouldn't fear the Torah. Like, oh, no, it's going to be a big burden. It's going to be a, a weight on my shoulders. No, you should welcome it. Just like going to the gym or eating it healthy is not something you dread, but something you love. And the more you do it, the more you love it. Because you realize how much better off your life is with it. So too, these values, these principles, these teachings, these mitzvot are meant to enrich and empower us. And when we understand that mentally and psychologically, then we will rush and yearn to do mitzvot rather than to fear it. But then there's another question. Why did God give two tablets? Why not one long tablet with 10 commandments, one through 10? And here our rabbis tell us an interesting idea, that the first tablet are the commandments between man and God. The second tablet is the commandments between man and man. So the first commandment is, I'm the Lord your God. Second commandment, don't have any other gods. Third the commandment, don't take God's name in vain. Fourth commandment, uh, honor the day of Shabbat. Fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. Remember Shabbat, honor your father and mother, and God is one of your parents. Our rabbis say you have three parents, so therefore it's part of the commandment between man and God, because God said when you honor your parents, you honor me. If you disrespect your parents, you disrespect me, because I'm your third creator, father, mother, and God, all work together to create a child. The father and mother create the biological body, and the God instills the soul. So therefore God says, I dwell with your parents. You have to respect me as well. So the first tablet between man and God. The second tablet says, don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't be a false witness, and don't be jealous, envious of others between man and man. Had God put one through 10, you would say, oh, the bottom five are less important than the top five. <clears throat> how you treat God is more important than how you treat your fellow man. So Judaism puts the two commandments. God gives two tablets side by side saying they're of equal importance. Don't think that keeping Shabbos or keeping kosher or wearing tefillin is more important than don't steal or don't commit adultery or don't be a false witness or don't be jealous. God is as concerned with how we treat our fellow man with how we treat God. And that's why in the high holidays on Yom Kippur, we can ask for atonement for our sins against God, but not against man, because God says you have to ask for forgiveness from your fellow man for those violations. So the Torah puts them side by side to say they are of equal importance, but it goes deeper than that. Not only that they're of equal importance, <clears throat> but that the two are interlinked. Because a lot of times, I'm sure you've met people like this, I've met them surely, and say, you know what? I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I'm a kind, caring, loving person. And it's true, they are. But you know what? I don't necessarily believe in the commandments between man and God. 
I could be a moral, ethical, righteous person without that. So God says, the truth is they're interlinked. And therefore the 10 commandments can be read not only one through five and then six through 10, but you could read them horizontally, one and six, two and seven, three and eight, on and on. And what is the way you do that? First commandment is, I'm the Lord your God. On the left column, number six is, do not commit murder. What's the connection? Every human being is in the image of God. And therefore, I always think to myself, imagine if Hitler, Yamach Shemot, cursed be his name, obeyed one commandment of the Ten Commandments, thou shall not commit murder. There would be 20, 30 more million Jews alive today. But if you don't believe that every human being is in the image of God, then God forbid you could come to the most disastrous conclusions that it's justified to murder other human beings. But if you know every human being is, if you believe in God and you understand that every human being is the image of God, then you never have a right to kill another human being. And so, yes, many people are moral. They won't kill another person regardless. But the Torah says, what's the, what's the safety, uh, measure to make sure no human being kills another human being it's not enough that it's based on my own rationality or my own feelings because a lot of people don't have rational minds Hitler had a whole philosophy of the Aryan race why he needs to murder not just Jews anyone who's different but if you understand that every human being was created by God equally in his image then you understand you cannot commit murder second commandment don't take do not have any other gods the seventh commandment is should not commit adultery. Once again, fidelity to God, fidelity to your spouse. So you learn fidelity and commitment and loyalty, not only between man and man, but between man and God. Third commandment is don't take my name in vain. And then when you get to the eighth commandment, you have the commandment that you shall not steal. And rabbis say that if you steal, you're gonna to have to cover up your theft. And you're eventually gonna swear falsely in God's name as you take an oath. So don't do something that will lead to taking God's name in vain. The fourth commandment is remember the day of Shabbat and make it holy. And the ninth commandment is don't be a false witness against your fellow man. Again, the rabbis say, what's the connection? Shabbat is bearing true witness that the world was not created by itself. It didn't just evolve by accident. We're not originating from apes and monkeys, but that God created man in his image by design and God created the world. And every Shabbat, we declare in the Kiddush, because God made the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. We declare that we believe in creation of God. We're witnesses to God's creation. Just like bearing true witness against your fellow man. And finally, the last two commandments, honor your father and mother and do not covet the possessions of others. And I rather say there's a correlation here as well, because, you know, a lot of people covet things. But, and sometimes you could even covet someone's personality. I wish I was as smart as him. I wish I was as talented as, wish I was as, as skillful, as talented, as charismatic. Uh, I wish I had this person's attributes. But very rarely, if ever, does anyone say, I wish I had someone else's parents. Why? Because you understand that the parents God gave you are your parents, for better or for worse. Even if your parents are not perfect, you love your parents. And the same thing all of our lives, we should see it in that regard, that whatever God gave us is what's meant for us, and we should love it. And furthermore, the Torah is teaching us how to be a good parent. If your children see that you're envious of others all the time, they will not grow up with self-esteem, with confidence. Part of being a good parent is keeping the 10th commandment, not to be envious of others. Now, not to be envious, it could be very difficult. And you may even ask, what's wrong with being envious? I'm not hurting anyone if in my heart I'm envious. Well, first of all, God's protecting you from yourself because God doesn't want you to live a life of misery. God wants you to be grateful and satisfied because you'll be happier. But also, if you're envious of someone, ultimately it may lead to you harming that person. If opportunity arises that you could say something negative about them or undermine them a little bit or demote them in some way, you may take that opportunity because you don't have goodwill in your heart. So the prerequisite to not hurting someone is to feel good about them, not to be envious of them. And therefore, those says, you're not allowed to be envious of your neighbor. Don't envy his wife. Don't envy his uh, possessions. Don't envy his house. 
And then the verse ends, and everything that belongs to your neighbor. Now the question is, the Torah is being specific. Don't envy his wife, his house, his donkey, his servants. Why does it have to say in everything? Why doesn't it just say, don't covet everything that belongs to your neighbor? So the commentaries give a very interesting insight how to overcome jealousy. Now, one of the ways to overcome jealousy, see, jealousy usually is targeted, meaning to say that I'm envious of something specific that a person has. <clears throat> so I may be envious of this person's wealth. I may be envious of this person's success. I may be envious of the wonderful uh, family this person has. I may be envious of someone's good looks. I may be envious of someone's good health. Whatever I'm envious of, popularity. But what the Torah is reminding us is that you can't pick and choose. Look at that person you're envious and ask yourself, would I want everything that belongs to your neighbor? Meaning, would you take their entire life as one package? You can't just say, I want this from this person, I want this from that person. If you looked at that person's whole totality, would you still want that person? And then you'll realize that you're blessed, that everyone has their strengths and everyone has their weaknesses. Everyone has their blessings and their drawbacks in life, their challenges. And you have to look at the totality of that. When you look at the totality, you'll say, yeah, maybe I'm lacking in this area, but look at all the other areas that I'm blessed to have in my life. And so therefore the Torah says the way to not be envious is to look at everything that you have in your life and then you'll be grateful and appreciative for the blessings in your life. One of the very beautiful uh, messages of the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai is the importance of Jewish education. Because our rabbis say that when God came to give the Torah, it says that God said, I want a guarantor. Give me a guarantee that you're going to keep the Torah. How do I know that in 2020, there'll still be Jews studying Torah? What guarantee do I have? So the Jews offered different guarantees to God. Our rabbis say the Jews said, our elders will be our guarantors. Well, make sure the elders sit and study Torah. And God says, no, that's not a good guarantee. That's not going to ensure Jewish continuity for thousands of years. So they said, okay, our scholars, our rabbis will be the guarantors. And God says, no, I don't accept that guarantee. And then they went on to say, our, our prophets. And each time God rejected, until the Jews said to God, our children will be the guarantors, meaning we pledge and promise in every generation to teach the children Torah. And that's when God said, okay, if you promise to teach your children Torah, the children will be the guarantors of the Torah, I will give you the Torah. And how remarkable it is that this is what has preserved the Torah, Jewish education, Talmud Torah, teaching our children from generation to generation has maintained Jewish continuity and Jewish tradition. And sadly, wherever there was a lack of Jewish education, the chain was broken. As someone said, if you see a cemetery, a Jewish cemetery in a town, you could know that there once was a Jewish community here. If you see a synagogue in a town, you know that there is a Jewish community in this town. If you see a Jewish school, in a town, you know there will be a Jewish community in this town. So the key is Jewish education. And God set it up front. When we said our children will be the guarantors, that's when God said, now I can give you the Torah. I know that Torah will be studied from generation to generation. Banenu areven badenu. Our children are the guarantors. And this has always been the hallmark and the secret to Jewish success and the primary emphasis of Jewish families to educate their children. But God took it one step further. When God came to give the Torah, he said, I want you to be not only responsible for yourself and for Jewish continuity in your own family by teaching your children and your grandchildren, but I want you to be responsible for each other. And therefore God made a mutual covenant with the entire Jewish people together. And therefore, our rabbis say, Kol Yisrael Arevim Zelazel. All Jews are responsible and guarantors for one another. We guaranteed each other so that if you see another Jew who is not engaged in Torah, who is not knowledgeable, you can't just say, well, me and my family, we're doing fine. We know, we observe, we practice, we study. No, you have a responsibility because at Mount Sinai, 
you signed the covenant, you agreed to care not only for yourself and your family and your children and your grandchildren, but for all Jews. Hence the idea that all Jews are mutually responsible for one another, guarantors for one another, and when a Jew is in trouble, physically, spiritually, whichever which way, we all feel instinctively and impulsively that we have to care. We are our brother's keepers, so to speak. Unlike Cain who said, I'm not my brother's keeper. Or am I my brother's keeper? We are our brother's keeper. And we have to reach out and care for. And this is something we see. I mean, I <clears throat> shared that just on Friday, as a Holocaust survivor in our community who lost her son and didn't have money for a funeral. I sent out an email. I can't tell you what an outpouring of support there was. People from all over the community were re calling me to donate money to help this woman bury her son, this woman they never met. But that's the Jewish nature. That's the Jewish quality. And where did that originate from? It originated from the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. There's many other aspects of Shavuot. And so as time is nearing the end, let me just focus on uh, one or two other very fundamental aspects of the holiday of Shavuot. On the holiday of Shavuot, we read the book of Ruth, one of the books of the scriptures. And my wife, Dini, is going to be giving a class tonight in depth on the book of Ruth. I encourage you, uh, everyone, uh, men and women, if you like, to go on to the class tonight to learn about the book of Ruth. It's a beautiful story. And I'm sure you know the overall story is the story about a man by the name of Elimelech. He was a wealthy man. He lived in Israel. He lived in Bethlehem, Yehuda, which ironically means the house of bread in Judea. He had a wife by the name of Naomi, and there's a famine in the land. Now, uh, we don't know what a famine is in America. Thank God we haven't experienced one. We know in the Bible, you know, Joseph, Pharaoh, there was famines. But a famine, you know, we're living through a pandemic and a famine in the olden days was like a pandemic. You know, sometimes uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of people could die with a famine. And so there's a famine, they need to find food. So Elimelech and Naomi go to look for food and they have two sons, uh, Machlon and Chilion, they travel out to the land of Moab. And the story goes that they're in the land of Moab, Elimelech dies, leaving Naomi a widow. And then her two sons marry two Moabite women. One of them is named Ruth, and the other one is named Arpa. And then tragically, her two sons die. So she loses her husband and her two sons, and now it's just her and her two daughter-in-laws. And she says, I'm going to go back to the land of Israel because I have nothing to stay here for now. And she tells her daughter-in-laws, listen, your husband is my son's died. I can't give you children. Stay here, you're Moabite women, and I will go back to Israel. And Arpa says goodbye to her mother-in-law and stays in the land of Moab. But Ruth famously says, wherever you go, I will go wherever you will dwell. I will dwell. Your nation is my nation. Your God is my God. And follows her mother-in-law back to the land of Israel. She's the first convert in Judaism. And therefore, or maybe Jethro, Yisro was a convert too. But this is the classical story of a convert. And since on Shavuot, we all received the Torah. We all became converts, so to speak. We all embraced Judaism for the first time. <clears throat> we read this book. But the story ends beautifully as she ends up marrying Boaz, a wealthy Jew, who is a kinsman, a relative. And Boaz takes her in and shows kindness. And the ending of the verses of this entire story of Ruth is that they give birth to a son by the name of Ova, who gives birth to a son by the name of Yishai, who gives birth to a son by the name of David. And so the grandson of this marriage between Boaz and Ruth is King David, the Davidic dynasty, all the way to the coming of Messiah. The kings of Israel come from this union. And the rabbis say, how did the story go from tragedy in the beginning to joy at the end? The rabbis say it's because of the kindness of Ruth and the kindness of Boaz. Ruth's kindness, where she says to her mother, I won't leave you. I'm going to stay with you. I'm not going to abandon my mother-in-law. And Boaz's kindness of marrying Ruth. And our rabbis teach us that through kindness, we could transform tragedy to blessings. We could go from brokenness, from isolation, from vulnerability, from pain, from suffering. And we could heal and rebuild and recover, just like the family of uh, Naomi. Uh, merits to have Ruth and Boaz give birth to the Davinic dynasty. And so if, going back to the idea of white being the color of kindness versus red, which is the color of judgment, this is a holiday that focuses on the primary message of the Torah, 
which is all about chesed, which is all about doing acts of kindness, something that we'll, we've seen a proliferation of during these days. And here's the most amazing thing. The rabbis say that King David, who was born from this union of Boaz and Rus, was actually born on, I'm sorry, was born and died on Atzeret, on this holiday of Shavuot. So we also commemorate the birth and the yard site of David Amelach on this holiday as well. One closing thought, and that is that we find the contradiction. We find on the one hand, when God offered the Torah to the Jewish people, they said, Na'asev and Ishma, we'll do and we'll listen to anything you ask us to do meaning that the Jews accepted the Torah unconditionally with great joy and enthusiasm. When God said, do you want my Torah? The Jews said, not seven Ishma. And that's why we received the Torah, because we enthusiastically said yes to God's proposal of marriage, of being his nation. On the other hand, there's a verse that says that the Jewish people stood under the mountain. And our rabbis tell us that God gave the Jews an ultimatum. God put the mountain over their head and said, listen, do you want my Torah? If you say yes, Fine. If not, I'll lower the mountain on top of you, and this will be your burial place. The mountain will be your tombstone. So this seems like a contradiction. On one end, it sounds like the Jews were so happy and positive and enthusiastic to accept the Torah willfully. On the other hand, it seems like it was done through coercion, through force. So, you know, it's one thing if a man gets down on his knee and says, will you marry me? And the girl says, yes, of course I'll marry you. We've all seen those proposals, right? It's beautiful. It's inspiring. But imagine a man puts a gun to a woman's head and says, will you marry me or else I'm going to pull the trigger? Well, what kind of marriage is that? So it's one thing to say the Jews said, yes, we'll take the Torah. We love the Torah. That's beautiful. That's inspiring. But what is the meaning? But what is the meaning of? What is the meaning of? The rabbi saying that he put the mountain over our head and coerced us and forced us to accept the Torah. What, is it, what does it mean he forced us to accept the Torah? And here, once again, continuing with this metaphor of marriage, because once again, it's all about the marriage of God and the Jewish people. You know, every bride and every groom, when they get married, the answer is, yes, I want to be married to you. I want to live with you for the rest of my life. I want to love you forever. Nothing could be happier. But you know, as time goes on, sometimes we have ups and downs in a marriage. And even if we're not having ups and downs, not every day are we madly in love, maybe with our spouse. Maybe one day we're having a bad mood, we're going through some tough times. But the idea of a marriage contract and a covenant is that I am pledging myself to be loyal and faithful to you and to love you and to take care of you and to cherish you and respect you every day of my life. And even if I'm not so happy with you one day, one day I'm disappointed in you, one day you let me down, or one day I have my own mood swing, and I'm not in the mood of being a good spouse. I took a promise, I took a pledge that I will be a faithful spouse to you and fulfill all my duties. And so therefore, marriage says, why do you need a co covenant? Why do you need an agreement, a contract? Because we're saying whatever may happen, we will always remain committed and loyal to one another. And that is the same idea of the Jews receiving the Torah. You know, there's some days you wake up, you're so inspired to be a Jew. Your, your soul is on fire. You can't wait to go to shul. You want to daven. You want to learn Torah. You want to do the mitzvot. Maybe one day you wake up and say, you know what? I need a break today. I'm not so inspired. I'm not motivated to go study or to perform this mitzvah or that mitzvah. And then what do you do? So if the marriage was only based on my excitement, my passion, my feelings, my love, my inspiration, when that inspiration wanes, I may say, well, today I'm not feeling it. I'm not in the mood. I'm not doing it. But if it transcends my emotions, it's a commitment that comes from my essence, from my core, regardless of what I may feel on any given day, I will always do what's right. I will always be committed to you. I will always take care of you and perform my duties and my obligations and my, my, my responsibilities. Then I do it every single day regardless. And the same thing with Judaism. God says, I don't want your commitment to be solely based on your feelings, on your passion. Yes, passion is vital. It's critical. It's essential. But you can't count on the passion or the inspiration being there every day of your life. We all have ups and downs. And this is true in marriage, it's true in parenting, it's true in everything, every endeavor in life. 
but the most important thing is the consistency. That regardless, whether it's Nasa and Ishma, yeah, we're ready to do whatever you want, or whether I have to put the mountain over your head. Either way, a Jew says, I will always do what God asks of me, whether I'm feeling motivated or not feeling so motivated, my actions will always be in accordance with Hashem's will. And so as we come to this very special holiday of Shavuot, and I'll just mention that, you know, it says that, it says that, uh, why did God give us the Torah of Mount Sinai? Because we were unified like one person with one heart. And I think that this Shavuot, as we approach the holiday, uh, we're more unified than ever before as a community. With all the social distancing, we're more attached and closer to each other. We think about each other more. We, we, we help each other more. We're more giving and more selfless because we've had the last two and a half months to think about what's really important, what our priorities are. And uh, in the merit of this, maybe we receive the Torah like never before. And I'll conclude with a story that I told recently on one of my daily Dvar Torahs. So if you heard it before, you'll be hearing it a second time. The true story and it happened in Israel over Passover and it really illustrates what this bond of oneness that we created at Mount Sinai how it endured and has been preserved for 3332 years so there was a woman in Israel uh, elderly woman and she lost her husband just a few months ago in January she was married almost 60 years and then the pandemic struck and Israel was on lockdown and nobody was able to go out of their homes. And her children were devastated because their mother was not only a widow, but now she would have to observe Passover by herself in isolation. And they were distraught that their mother would be alone for the first time in her life without her husband and without her children or grandchildren. And what happened was there were neighbors who lived across the yard in the adjacent apartment. Uh, and, the, and they called out to her one day from the window and they said, you know, we know you're all alone for Passover. We have an idea we thought of. This was a family with seven children. They said, why don't you move your, your Passover Seder table to your window? We'll move ours to our window and we'll sing the Seder very loud and say the prayer as loud so that you could hear and participate through the alleyway from the open windows. She was so delighted with the idea and that's what she did. And she told her kids, you don't have to worry, I'm going to have this family, I'm very close to them, that we're going to sit by the windows, we're going to do a joint Seder. And that's what happened. They sang the songs and the Manashtan and the prayers and everything was beautiful. After Passover, the children called us and said, Mom, how was your holiday? And she said, it was unbelievable. And with tears in her eyes, she said, how, how it was so beautiful to sit with these children and their family and hear the four questions and the singing. And then she says, you're not going to believe it. But it was unbelievable. This family has all the same songs, traditions, melodies, tunes that, that dad, that Abba used to sing. I felt like he was leading the Seder because they, they sing all the exact melodies that we sing in our family. That we've always sang, that, my, that Abba always sang. The children were listening on the phone and they were crying too because they knew something she didn't know. And that is that this family called every one of her children before Passover and said, we're going to be having a Seder with your mom across the alleyway with the open windows. We don't want her to feel alone. We know she's grieving for her husband. Send us a recording of all the songs, all the melodies, all the traditions that your late father would sing at his Seder so we could learn them and sing all those melodies so your mom will feel connected to her husband and won't feel so alone on this holiday. That's the love. That's the unity. That's the beauty of the Jewish people. That's what we receive together with the Torah at Mount Sinai. Let us just remember that what has united us as a Jewish people? What has united us as a Jewish people? Not a land, because we were in exile for most of our existence. It's not a language, because we've been scattered in every corner of the earth with different languages. It's not a culture, because we lived in different lands, Sephardic, Ashkenazic, uh, all different places where Jews lived had different cultures around them. There's only one constant uniting force that unified the Jewish people for all of these 3,332 years, and that is the Torah. The fact that we all have the same Torah, the same holidays, the same observances, the same rituals, that's what connects a Jew from Australia to Israel to America to any corner of the earth, China, doesn't matter where a Jew is. They had the same Torah, the same observances, the same commandments. And it's the Torah which kept us strong, 
and united and the Torah that will always keep us strong and united. So let us rededicate ourselves to not only studying Torah and Shavuot, but increasing our observance of Torah mitzvahs in our personal lives, and most importantly, devoting ourselves to teaching our children the next generation. By doing that, we'll have a joyous Shavuot, and by learning the lesson of kindness of Shavuot and the story of Ruth, we'll start to rebuild our communities and our society, hopefully on a new foundation, a foundation of chesed, of kindness and love towards one another. Wish everyone a wonderful day, and look forward again. My wife will be giving a class tonight on the Book of Ruth. It should be in the same email. I encourage everyone to participate, to learn more about this incredible woman, Ruth. Have a wonderful Thank day. Thank you, Rabbi. And we wish everyone all the best. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to see each and every one of you. All the best. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.